Tim, it's another Friday. Yes, how are you doing? How are you, how, how are you doing this fine Friday? I'm, I'm just so excited that the weather is turning. <laughs> As am I. I've been I'm uh, I've been watching outside my window here and seeing the push of March and the push of March, and I can't wait until it finally breaks through to our spring. Yeah. So listen, I've been uh, kind of going over some of our thought processes on what's coming out or what has come out with the new PMBOK version seven. And it's kind of, and I would say from what I'm seeing, it's kind of a bent now more towards a human centered approach to project management. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that, um, but, but let me kind of give you where I'm coming from because when I broke into this uh, industry, as a programmer and then up through the analysis, you know, and then team lead roles and eventually to the project management role, I was very much steeped in project management process, working for a company that was well known for its project management processes. But in those days, and you and I have discussed this, I don't know how many times, it was arch and charts, or as you say, <laughs> rules and tools. And we felt that as long as we followed the process, we could not fail. But um, what happened to me in 2003 was an interesting turn because I left my corporate career and went out as a consultant to work with end user organizations. And suddenly I had an epiphany and that was I watched the end user organization and how they were, I'll use the word treated by the system integrator that came in, by the IT professionals. And at that moment, I thought, you know what? This process-oriented approach is not conducive to good human relations or certainly not conducive to good uh, relations with the, uh, with the end user or with their clients. And so at that point, I made in my own mind and in my own practice a huge shift from process to people. Uh -huh. is that, and, go ahead. And, and that's the key right there. Um, it was limiting. Um, and you know what? You're right. It was a human component that was missing, but there was something else that was missing too. Um, something happened between 1980 and 2011. We had this whole thing called Agile, and it forced us to question, is this process-focused um, uh, approach to project management limiting us um, because the way it was designed, it forced us to build on what was there and not be able to contain it. See, if, if, if you want to control a system, you look at the bigger picture and then you're able to say, this is what's happening across all of this thing. And then there's some interesting things here. And there's some interesting things here. So up until about 2000, 2011, we were saying project management is the arts and charts. And because there's people, we have to manage and lead. But what happens if we focus on a different aspect and a different approach to project management? And all of a sudden, these arts and charts are just one solar system in the galaxy of project management and looking through this is what this whole whole PMBOK 7 says this is one way of looking at project management this this structure we call the project management framework now if you set this aside and we go up or pop up another level let's talk about this broader framework and that's what we're looking at well, we are. And, and quite frankly, I was not even aware of Agile until probably in the last five years. So if it was around since the 1980s, consider me as a person who did not know. However, <laughs> it's possible that, you, you know, how it's kind of like these movements come through um, culture or through civilization. And it's almost as though the entire IT organization began to think that there's something missing. Because to me, that old process-oriented approach that I was used to was almost like the 1950s hierarchical, um, autocratic approach to managing teams and managing um, companies from that perspective. And so 
I, as I mentioned, I had this epiphany when I was working in client organizations. I had this epiphany to the point that I renamed my company to People First Project Management, LLC. This is awesome. Yeah. This is awesome because you're right. In the end, it, it, uh, the, the work we do and the commerce and business we do is shaped by human behavior. Now, this is what gets really fascinating. Today, and you, you and I decided to talk about one aspect of the seventh edition of PMBOK, which is domains. Um, there are eight domains, and they're a group of related activities critical for the effective delivery of project outcomes. Now, that sounds a lot like knowledge areas, especially when we list them, right? The, the eight, there's the stakeholders and teams. There's the development approach and life cycle, planning and work and delivery and measurement and uncertainty. So you have two humanistic domains and you have six, well, five really that talk about projects and project management. And then we have the unknown, which is both complexity and risk together. Now, here's the goofy thing. If we say they're knowledge areas, we may be missing the target. Hear me out on this, okay? A knowledge area is the skills we have to pull from, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Scope, schedule, cost, quality, risk, uh, contracts, and resources, and stakeholders, and integration, and all that, right? They're what we pull from to do work. What we're doing is we're looking at areas we apply project management to. Instead of what we pull from to do projects, we're looking at the areas we apply it to. Well, and, and that makes really gets interesting. Yeah, and that and that makes a lot of sense because in the Pinbox six, I reading between the lines in the old Pinbox six, five, et cetera. I got the feeling that they were kind of trying to come up to that, that sort of thought process, but it almost was, it was almost still the way it was written in the sequential process almost made the project manager think that they have to do projects in the sequential processes and thereby stakeholders and teams weren't their own knowledge area or their own domain or focus area. They were sort of afterthoughts. Well, not really afterthoughts, but they were really part of existing processes that you did sequentially. And so I think this new bent or this new way of looking at things clarifies what you just said. It's yeah. Project management into process as opposed to pulling from process. Right, exactly. And, and again, this extends the PMBOK and project management instead of being a set of tools is a structure we can use to analyze and focus no matter what the tools are. Well, and if I look at those eight domains that you rattled off so conveniently and so quickly, <laughs> rather than doing them sequentially with a couple of humanistic domains as, as a sort of side, you know, side thoughts, it really is all of these work together concurrently in a project. It's not like I do planning once and then forget about it. It's planning all the way through. It's work all the way through. It's stakeholders all the way through. It's my team all the way through. And yeah, and bless the bless the earlier PEM box. But you read down the framework, you know, good old <laughs> page 25, and you look, man, that's sequential. And it's just human nature to say, I do this first, this, 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 and this. But you're right. When you look at this, it's integration is inferred by laying these things out. It's, it's really hard to get people's mindset to change. But once you start understanding it, you understand that this has opened up a really good framework for not just managing projects, but for looking at all business and commerce. Well, and, and let me give you another observation I had, and I don't know if this was an epiphany, another epiphany or an aha moment or something, but perhaps I come from it because I've done so many consulting engagements all across this country and in Canada. 
So having worked in 20 US states on a variety of projects in a couple of Canadian provinces, here's what I can tell you. Every project, every organization, every team is different. And so to put that implication of the older process oriented approaches onto teams and make them all look cookie cutter doesn't work. And I think that's possibly why so many projects had difficulty or failed altogether. Whereas this new approach or this new view of how we manage projects allows us to tailor based on the differences in the organization, the process, the people, the, all of that sort of thing. Right, right. And, and all of a sudden tailoring is not just a uh, just a paragraph or a topic. It's it's a major concept that actually allows this to be flexible. And we're talking about organizational preference and business requirement. And all of a sudden that takes center stage and it really highlights the value of a project manager and project management. We're not just you know, the gatekeepers for knowledge and the spreadsheets and stuff like that. We're not just doing that. We're actually facilitating the tailoring for good practice. Well, and I like, <clears throat> excuse me, and I like the way it was laid out in this latest version. You mentioned the eight, uh, eight domains, which are kind of running concurrently, not siloed anymore. But the next concept that applies to all of those eight domains is that tailoring concept. Yeah. Now, I have a question for you. I, I know we may not get to the answer today <laughs> because you and I probably have not really done our research enough, but do you think there's any gap in the domains? Um, is this enough of a structure for us to say, yeah, this is good enough for us to actually approach project management in a new project? Well, I'll give you this much. I'm just looking at my notes here and in terms of what the domains are. I will give you this much. I have not gone deep, deep, deep into each of the domains, but if there was something that I personally would call out from my experience, that would be the whole implementation side of a project. You know, a lot of what we do, we focus on the people and the process and these domains to get the project done, but the project's not done until it's out there and working. And I'm wondering if maybe that's part of project work or, or pro part of delivery or something within the current eight domains. But I personally would like to see that called out as a ninth domain because there's a whole raft of new processes that take a different kind of person in terms of organizational change management, in terms of release planning with the end user in mind and the end users end users in mind. So I, that's, that's one of the things that I would do. I don't know, what, have you thought through that as well? Yeah, I always thought it was interesting to actually look at two or three things. Number one, value delivery seems to be a primary topic. <laughs> yeah. Basically, we don't just deliver a deliverable, we deliver something that's useful it fulfills a use it provides value it solves a problem that's what we do right that's now true. value delivery says you can't just have acceptance criteria you can't just say we're done with the work you have something called definition of done which means we have something functioning we have go live and so in the training material, <laughs> they're talking about just that. In each one of the five sections, they address value delivery, they address definition of done, and they address go live. And so this is already being taught in the, uh, in the PMP prep classes and project management classes that PMI has signed off on. And so we're seeing what you're talking about as maybe um, an emergent wave that we can see more clearly in the future. Well, and I like that thought because there's something that we haven't touched on and probably will not, well, we won't have time this week, this time, but there's something called the project management principles that kind of overlay this entire domain process. I wonder, is value one of those or perhaps maybe it should be? 
we'll look at that. I I would love to pursue that. I'm, oh. you know, I would I would put my money on it. But let's uh, let's withhold our uh, our uh, discussion on that until we Absolutely. get into the principles. Absolutely. But yeah, the domains are really powerful, and it's it's funny um, that we're talking about that. In fact, we should be talking more about the domains in detail, and I'd like to explore all of them. But let's just sort of do a high level discussion, and even with that, we may not have time to look at it. Okay. Yeah. So, so let's look at the domains and let's actually, if we need to extend this domain discussion into next week, how's that? Well, I think uh, that's great. Cause I think the way you and I are so committed to the whole process and, and have become over probably the last year and a half more committed to the people side of the house. I think if we just handle those two domains, even in our discussion today, uh, and left the more technical, more process-oriented domains till another time. I think we would do ourselves and our uh, audience good. Is that a good? Is that good grammar? We would do them good. That would work. That would okay. work. Um, so let's let's go ahead and withhold everything and just look at our two people domains, and that's stakeholders and um, team. Now, what is strange about calling out stakeholders and teams what 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 actually gets your attention or curiosity here well i can't in fact part of my discussion i want to uh, after we talk about this part part of what i want to do is see if i can get inside your thought process in terms of why why pmi even went this direction because it is a fairly large kind of left turn from the previous uh, versions of the project management process but to answer your question, I really think that as we mature as an organization and we mature as a as a, um, a a career and a culture, project management is a culture as well as a career. I think that maturity says, wait a minute, we can't have teams as the recipients of process. We can't have stakeholders as also rands in our in our process. We need to have them front and center working with us. So by pulling them forward and calling them out and applying project management principles to the interaction and the relationships with those folks that have to work with us on teams, I think that has absolutely changed the entire thought process around how it is we manage projects. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> That's you, beautiful, beautiful. Do, do you agree with me, Tim? <laughs> Yes, I, yeah. uh, you know, when, when you said it, it, everything just clicked together. It made total sense. Now, here's my question for you. Where did sponsors go? To me, I, I've never differentiated between sponsors and stakeholders. To me, uh, a sponsor can be one that is actually funding the project, in which case they are my major stakeholder. Or they could be, as in a lot of the projects that I worked with, with U.S. state governments were sponsored in terms of, uh, what would I say, in terms of rules and requirements by the federal government. So the main sponsor may have been the federal government and legislation from the feds, but my main stakeholder was still my state, um, state person that I was working with. So I think sponsors are an absolutely essential part of the stakeholder community. Very good, very good. Let me let me give you an example that it emphasizes what you just said. Okay, so a lot of my work was going in and helping decision makers decide whether or not they needed a data center now or in three years or in 10 years. And what they did was they would hire us for six weeks, maybe three to five of us. And we had finance experts, we had data experts, we had uh, 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 IT experts, and we had construction experts, and they all came together, right? And these guys actually um, would say, you know what, our sponsor's changing. I was sponsoring you to build the charter. Now that we're talking about $10 million, I'm no longer the sponsor. And so I, as you, said, you know what? <clears throat> the money's coming in. 
We need to identify the stakeholder who is the decision maker, but we also need to have key stakeholders. So like you, I, I turned to the, uh, the, the general truth that says a sponsor is a unique stakeholder that provides a source to approving resources, approving funding. But, and that's exactly, that's exactly kind of the example that I was using as well with my federal sponsors versus state um, people responsible for the project. But let me tell you a stakeholder that's often left out of the equation. <clears throat> and this hit me once when I was doing a uh, oversight for a major, 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 huge project, huge project um, in a state whereby we were going into pilot we thought before we go to pilot, it's one thing for the people who are out in the community who are using our system, but they use our system to benefit their clients. So why don't we go one step further and talk about the clients of our clients? Mm -hmm. And one of the particular situations was we had um, legal requirements to send out notices. You get them in your bank statements, you get them in your uh, 401 case that you get them in, you get all of these legal requirements, right? But they often are in legalese or they're often hard to understand. And a lot of the clients of our client were fourth grade, fifth grade educated people in, in terms of their, their ability to kind of negotiate some of these legal notices. So we physically took these legal notices out and sat down in the lobby of our customers' offices with their clients and said, read this and tell me what you think. And based on that, we used their input to completely revamp and improve all of the notification systems. But the stakeholder in that situation was the end user's end user. Thoughts? Yes. In business school, we had so, a concept called the final end user. And when you're talking about, quote unquote, voice of the customer, um, you're talking about the final end user. Those are the true customers. And those are some of the most critical um, stakeholders that you need to satisfy. And, and it's very hard in consulting to, number one, even consider getting an audience. Number two, understand the needs and expectations. Because under contract, you're given just what you need to do your work. And it's really hard to convince people to uh, release that, that privileged information. Well, and your mind gets into the situation where I need to satisfy my customer. And you don't often, as an IT person or as a project person, you don't often think I need to, the way I, I satisfy my customer is by satisfying my customer's customer. Yeah, and, and this is where user-centered design comes in. Um, yeah. You know, it's not the owner-centered design. It's not the decision maker that we're making happy. It's the people who eventually have the solution in their hands that have to live with it day in and day out. Let me give you another real quick example of a stakeholder that I came across. Um, we had a situation where the, um, the staff of our client was unionized. The union had nothing to do with the system that we were developing, absolutely nothing, but they represented those who would be using the system. And so we got in contact with and communication with the union representation very, very early in the project and oh, yeah. they kept them abreast of what we were doing. So they were sort of a uh, arm's length stakeholder, but nonetheless, a stakeholder that could benefit us or could slow us down. So yeah, we have to think through all of these human aspects. So yeah, we had, um, we had as part of our um, exploration is the administrative staff, the admins. Um, but the problem is through 2000 to 2007, all of a sudden admins went away. <laughs> Automation yeah. got rid of it. So we didn't have that platform of users we could interact with. And I'm wondering if there is some type of intermediary um, group or focus group or something that we can rely on on a general standpoint to actually uh, um, create that, you know, that focus of information where everybody in the corporation goes to for questions. Oh, that's a great idea. 
<laughs> but let's, uh, I want to get to teams, but let's just kind of summarize this, the stakeholder domain for a second in terms of how do you think our project management processes, and in Pinbox 7 or not, but how do you think, given that the fact that the stakeholders now its own domain, how do you think that we as uh, practitioners need to satisfy that particular domain? I, uh, I really appreciate this conversation we've had because they are not a source of information. They are a focus of yeah. information. Now, that statement alone is what I've been trying to tell my students for the last decade and a half, <laughs> yeah. right? It, the project is not about you. <laughs> yeah, you are not the project. You are the servants, you are the service that create what these guys are going to need. You only exist and your relationship only exists because there is a need and there are stakeholders. Boy, I tell you, you know, and, and so much of what I do in IT, I think ever since I broke into IT, and this goes back more than 40 years, I've often drawn parallels between IT building systems and a carpenter or a foreman building a new house. And it's, that's a great analogy. You're not building this new house for you. You're building it for the end user. Now, you should build it with pride such that you would want to live in it. But at the same time, you're building it for someone else. And it's not about you. Yeah, you, you know, and you understand the engineering. And yeah. that's the value you bring. Now, the the ownership and the the uh, responsibility and accountability after that transition must be must be in their hands but you own making it functional for them so that they can be fully satisfied exactly so let's uh, let's switch to the other domain the other human domain and by the way i've got i still have some questions about about uh, getting into your head as to what do you what do we think pmi did here but let's talk about teams for a second Stakeholders, we absolutely need to focus on stakeholders. But, you know, in, in the old days, teams were just a means to an end. I mean, they were, you know, like almost like cannon fodder in the old armies, right? The programmer didn't work out, you turfed them and you brought a new one in. That was the old way of doing things. But that's not how to build relationships. That's not how to build teams. So, again, can we talk about the focus that this new domain thought process has put on working with teams? Let me let me introduce you to uh, a little bit of research that was done between 2005 and uh, about 2015 2017. It was performed by the Gallup um, uh, survey group, and where is that? Just a second here. Here we go. And um, Gallup Research and Jim Clifton of the Clifton. Uh, um, Strengths finder, right? Sort of like the Myers Briggs uh, yeah. character structure. And they came up with some really weird results. This is pulled out by, you know, and it is explicit in the book. It's all about the manager. <laughs> okay. And listen to this. Crucial elements of workplace culture that influence productivity. Now, role clarity. If people know their roles, they know what work they need to do. And you can assign it. Having an opportunity to do what you do best. Work within your strengths. People work on stuff they enjoy. They learn stuff that they enjoy. They read books while they're eating dinner on stuff they enjoy, and that's what they get strong in, okay? Giving people a chance to work on that stuff they enjoy. Opportunities to develop, okay? Strong coworker relationships, a common mission and purpose. If a manager gives that to employees, if we give that to our teams, they will be quote unquote engaged. They'll be plugged in. They will want to come to work. They'll want to do work better than we could ask them of. Now, I have a whole laundry list of benefits from engaged employees and managers 
are the ones that give this. In fact, Gallup determined that 70% of the variance in team engagement was under the control of a manager, not the team. You have more influence on the engagement of a team as a project manager than the team does themselves. You have control over those things. This could lead to a whole separate podcast just on that because, <laughs> you know, the idea of agile is that you are, you are their leader, but you are their servant leader, meaning, meaning that you allow the team often to make some of the decisions. I mean, you're, you're guiding them. Now, now the trick is, the trick is, how do I get my team engaged? I just gave you a list of things yeah. right there. And that's all you have to do. And yeah, we, we could talk about this. It's, it, and it's under the influence. This is a beautiful thing. You don't have to find these people. This is, this is human behavior at its best. You create a certain type of environment, they'll plug in, they'll be excited, and you won't be able to hold them back. Well, there's a couple of things that you said when you read some of that out. One was I, I picked up on the word culture mm -hmm. and I picked up on the word engagement, which to me also can lead to high producing or high product, productive, highly productive teams, high performing teams. And so when I look at that, you know, compared to the when I broke into the industry where you sort of did what the project manager said without question, you just did it. Right. But now to have this kind of ability for um, team members to, to basically assert themselves as much or as little as they need to, still while maintaining um, process and productivity towards the end result, what, a, what an incredible difference and what an ability to build that culture and that highly performing team. Less safety in incidents, fewer defects, higher customer ratings, higher productivity, higher sales, higher profitability. What business doesn't want this? Now, also, it's a team that's going to want to continue doing this, okay? Yeah. Because you're teaching them how to be leaders themselves. And in the new PMBOK 7, they talk about this. Number one, the uh, PMBOK says this isn't just about project managers. This is about everyone. And number two, leadership skills are not just the things that the decision maker has. It's everybody up and down the line. They have the accountability. They have the responsibility. They have the motivation through their engagement. You know, it's interesting. I was thinking back to a couple of <clears throat> engagements that I was involved in where I was assisting the organization in selecting their system integrator for a very, uh, very highly valued system. And one of the things we decided to do because they were so evenly matched, we had two system integrators that rose to the top and they were very evenly matched in both process and product offerings and that sort of thing. We decided to bring them in for a day, day and a half of oral presentations, oral, uh, interviews, that sort of thing, just to see the people that we would be engaging with for the next four years. Here's what's interesting. One team dominated because it looked like they were a team. It looked like they enjoyed each other, like they had worked together before. The other team was highly, um, what would I say? They were highly experienced, very competent, but they looked like they just met at the airport on their way to the oral presentations. <laughs> and what a difference between the two. And you knew immediately which team you wanted to engage. engage you know, with. this is really interesting because I, I was confused when I looked at the new training material in 2021 that PMI has um, for preparation. And it said, build the team, build the team, focus on the team, focus on the team, help the team become engaged servant leadership. And it goes on for 10 hours before you even start talking about what a project is. And I'm thinking, Tim, this is not sequential. That was the first thing I thought. Second of all, Tim, why does PMI think that this is so important? It's... <laughs> Well, exactly what we've been talking about, right? It's the high performance that comes out as a result of that. And I'm going to, this. I want this to be a tweetable quote, although it won't be, <laughs> but 
high performing teams are not made by showing them a Gantt chart. That's right. That's right. It's not about the Gantt charts. No, it's it's not, it's not about the Gantt charts. It's about the relationships. Um, <coughs> it's about the relationships, and it's about the mindset. You're right. We have we have to see Gantt charts as a tool to yeah. measuring and analyzing, but we have to see relationships as the tool we use to project success. Now, it takes not a change in skills or knowledge. It takes a change in mindset, which means, sure. go ahead, go ahead. No, that's, that's very important because, uh, and I don't want anybody listening to us right now thinking that we are throwing out process. <laughs> we are not. Process is so foundational. But if, it's, if we only rely on process and not some of these domain aspects that we're talking about with stakeholder and with team, we won't be as successful as we otherwise could be or would be. You know, it, it really is interesting. Um, when, when we talk about project management and um, we talk about agile, um, a lot of people think project management goes away. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Well, yeah. Okay. Where does the budget go in Agile? <laughs> Where does risk go in Agile? Where does the schedule go in Agile? They're modified. And that's why we had to go to this framework of principles and domains. Again, we're looking at not focusing on a source for these tools, but using these tools as accompaniments to actually focus on the areas of project work. Exactly. And when it comes to teams, though, one of the things I don't want to leave out because so often project managers do, and that is that part of our team is the subject matter experts that the client provides for us. They're as much of the team as my top-notch developer, my top-notch trainer, my top-notch organizational change management expert. These are the people that I need to rely on, not only for institutional knowledge, but also for giving me that kind of whiteboard creative approach to how can I make their lives better with the system that I'm going to develop for them and with them. So, so I was struggling with this um, back in 2016 or 2017, because I was thinking, are stakeholders part of the team? Are subject matter experts part of the team? Are the team the experts? How does this all fit in? And I finally decided, and, and this was like many nights uh, and a lot of coffee, that the team are just as the definition says, the team does the work. User acceptance testing is the work. Your stakeholders are part of the team. Your vendors under contract to do part of the work, they're part of the team. And so when we're talking about team in this edition of PMBOK, we're talking about stakeholders. We may need to change not necessarily the definitions, but our mindset around what stakeholder and teams mean. Yeah, I remember very specifically, this uh, probably more than once, but I, I remember very specifically an occasion I was working, in, it was for the state of Oklahoma, we we're doing a large project there. And it's interesting, but we had the uh, IV and V, um, independent validation verification person come in to look at our process partway through. <clears throat> and so they gathered our team together, then they interviewed different people. <clears throat> they, they interviewed teams, they interviewed me, they interviewed the, cl the client sponsor. They interviewed a whole bunch of different parts of the project team. Mm -hmm. And then they came back and wrote up their report and we got pretty much greens on every aspect they were looking at. In fact, I think we got green on everything. But here's what they said on their way out. They, they went to the client sponsor and they go, now who is your team and, and who is the vendor team? Which <laughs> people belong to which? To me, that was the greatest compliment a project manager could ever receive 
And that is that the team so melted and developed such a culture that they couldn't tell who was vendor SI and who was um, end user client. Right, right, right. That that there is the team, and and in these large formal projects, the, when when they're successful, there's a lot of uh, of um, value in being part of the team. And yeah. this is what we struggle with. If you want your stakeholders to be supportive, how about making them a member of the team? Just whether it's by name or by participation or any type of engagement. This is, you know, so many questions in the PMP exam is a stakeholder coming saying, I'm not happy. I did not get this communication. I was not participating in this meeting. And we forget that maybe if we just thought about this in a different way, we wouldn't be such gatekeepers and we'd allow opportunity for a little growth. Boy, that's the kiss of death for a stakeholder not to feel that they're part of what's going on. <laughs> and in fact, I, I was in a meeting this morning where one of the stakeholders said, Oh, I may be a couple of days behind, but could you explain to me? And what that says is rather than think, well, why are you behind? Why aren't you on top of your emails or what whatever? Did, it's what did question. I do wrong? <laughs> yes. Why aren't we keeping it? Exactly. That's exactly <laughs> correct. So it all comes down to that. So, but I want to get back to, I think we've kind of covered culture or um, stakeholder and team fairly, fairly deeply and why they're a focus area or domain. But I just, Tim, you're much closer to the PMI organization than I ever have been. I want to get inside your head and see if you are inside PMI's head. Why, why did they make such a, what I would consider such a large left turn to go from much more process-oriented PMBOK 6 to this different? And I, and I don't say that project management is so much different. I think the way that we view it and now conduct ourselves under this new, new um, auspices is the way we should go. So what do you think? Why do you okay. think? Let me tell you a little story. First of all, the discovery of math is fascinating. Study the history of math and you might understand this. Um, the 13th um, theorem um, says that I must be able to do certain things with math in a certain way, and it must have a certain result. These theorems of math build on each other, and each one is more and more complex. The basic ones are like, here's a point, here's a line, here's a two-dimensional subject, here's a three-dimensional subject, and here's how they work. And if you have two dimensions, you can look at area and three dimensions, you can look at volume. And if you look at area, and if you have a triangle, if you create, if you look at that triangle as half a square, it's really easy to follow the area. Now, a lot of great smart people in the 17th and 1800s said, you know what, let's use traditional logic. And let's, let's just say, Let's try to break these things, okay? And they said, okay, in order to understand the area of a triangle, a triangle has to be 180 degrees on each, uh, the sum of the angles of a triangle have to be 180 degrees, right? Now, one of these smart guys said, let's try to break that. Let's see what happens when we have a triangle where the degrees add up less to that. Let's see what happens when we have a triangle that has something bigger than that. And you know what? He learned how to describe um, a triangle on the outside of a ball and on the inside of a ball. And he was able to do math it, by, by accident. By trying to break math, he found out that math was bigger. And this actually led to a whole area of, of algebra that we use to build bridges, to lay cables that have curves in them, any type of math that looks 
at a curve instead of a straight line uses this math. And we wouldn't be able to describe it in math today, except for that accident. Now, that's what I'm thinking might have been going on. See, in 2000 to 2011, we had project management just really stall in its tracks because you have this guy Brooks writing the mythical man month and he says software the way it is today and the way projects are run today doesn't work we have to approach it with a different mindset and he he mentioned the triple constraint he mentioned all sorts of things and this got a lot of people thinking and that's where agile started way back then now if you look at the PMBOK and its development since 1999, it's just gotten bigger and more complex and bigger. And if you project that out, <coughs> you know, within the next 50 years, we're going to have an entire library of a PMBOK and that's not going to work. So what they said was, is there something more general we can talk about? Can we pull both agile and predictive life cycles out of project management. So project management can talk about projects itself. And then we can say, let's apply predictive and then see within that model, see what it works. Let's apply agile and see what that looks like. And all of a sudden you have a core of things that basically are not going to change, like human behavior, like stakeholders and teams, and like the other domains. That's what I think was happening. I, I think <laughs> your math lesson kind of threw me for a loop. It's like, oh, so it's one big accident. The <laughs> Pimbox 7 came. That's not what I know. That's not what it's innovation. And innovation, innovation, innovation yeah. is nothing more than an accident. <laughs> it's people say, wow, that worked over here. Does it work over here? Yeah. And and that's the beautiful thing. We 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 stumble on these things. It and so go ahead. Now, from my perspective, I just thought it was something as simple as, you know what? Because I looked at the statistics and even up until 2000, I think 19, we were still at a 40 to 50% failure rate on IT projects. And I think somebody sat back and said, what is going on here? We have all the process, we have everything defined. We've given them templates, we've given them ways of doing um, project management, of of doing agile, of doing pr predictive, of doing all of these things, and we're still failing. What's missing? And I think somebody said, have we ever thought about talking to the people? <laughs> and then maybe some of the human, and, and you know, that we've, we're hearing more and more of the human-centered design approach to developing projects, but also I think to managing projects. And I think, so I think you're right. I think it's an innovation and evolution, but I think somebody came up and said, the old way just isn't working as well as it should be. So you, you have a very, very, very valid argument there. Incredibly valid. Um, for such conversations, Project Management Institute uses somebody called the Standish Group. Right. The, and chaos, the, stand, people. the chaos people. The chaos people, yeah. And they've been predicting this turn in the road that we're going through right now, that, that disruption or pivot. And we've been seeing this in business since the 1960s. And yeah. go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I saw it, but I, I, I don't want to say that I'm smarter than people because to me, what happened was when I literally went and sat in the chair of my customer, when I left corporate IT and went and sat in the chair of my customer and helped them with the IT people coming into their lives and into their domain, I said, Son, now I know it's not working. They are not treating these clients with respect. It, you know, if you understand human behavior, and, and this is what Marcus Aurelius said, if you understand human behavior and human nature, it all makes sense. You know, yeah. you, you, can't, you can't understand people unless you set aside your own opinions. <laughs> It seems common sense, right? For 3,000 years, we've been teaching this and nobody listens. You can't, you can't really understand other people unless you understand yourself. And on top of that, if you don't take care of the group, if you don't take care 
of the organization, the community. It's not going to take care of you. And these simple truths are not so simple. And we've forgotten that. It's not that we've forgotten it. It's just for, you know, for, uh, for urgency's sake and to be expeditious. We've always considered, well, we'll take care of the people later. No, we'll clean up our mess after we get this thing in place. We got to hurry and get it in place. And so what we've been seeing is, and, and project management is not the only area where we're seeing this, yeah. is that we're saying, you know what? We're putting the cart before the horse. We got to get this people stuff straightened out. And then we can actually do good work. Yeah, and I think I can, um, when you said it's not just in project management, <clears throat> I know I, I I can think but back to my analogy of building a home. When the foreman who is steeped in every possible understanding of how to build a house ends up focusing on the blueprints and has his staff focus on the blueprints so that they get this, this box up versus the, the, the foreman who looks at the blueprints but looks at his team and saying, are you seeing any differences in the blueprints that we could improve? Looking at the customer and saying, um, if we move this bathroom over six feet, look what it would do to you, do for you. And, it, and it's, there's a difference between blueprints only and blueprints plus the satisfied customer and satisfied team. I think yeah, that's yeah. where I kind of came to that realization. Yeah. As well. the, the, and all of a sudden the team takes a different role. The team is not just the experts in the engineering of the work. Right. They're the experts in the interpretation of the engineering. And the beautiful thing about this is, if you can delegate that, if we can, and, and the PMBOK uh, 7 doesn't get into this level of detail, but if we can actually delegate this interpretation and build this relationship between the team and the stakeholder, this frees us up to have a more executive and a more strategic relationship with not just our stakeholders, but our key stakeholders. And it allows us to relax and sit back away from all this. You know, they're, they're doing the schedule. Yeah, I have my key indicators. They're keeping me involved. And I can actually be interpreting the strategic value as they're doing the technical value discussion. And not only that is now I can go and engage my customer main stakeholders and see what's really on their mind. Because what happens is the stakeholders have visions, but as the project progresses and they see some results, that vision may tweak a little. And so we wanna be able to stay on top of that vision. Not that we wanna expand scope or do those sorts of things, but we wanna always have them embraced. And if you're over here busy doing versus over here busy strategizing, I almost said strategizing, strategizing with your customer what a difference in the end product oh boy and you know what this opens up so many options for career development for transition within a company or within an industry um this this is not just you know getting uh getting uh salary increases this is getting promotion stuff we're talking about well, if you're only in it for the salary increases, you, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but the thing is, it's it it really that's where the real game is, and yeah. that's what I found out when I was a quote unquote you know entry level project manager. It was fun, but when I was a consultant and people were bringing their problems to me, that's when things got exciting. Yeah, that's what exactly when I got to sit in an executive's. Um, across the desk from an executive and just kind of talk through that person's vision of what this system is going to do for their company, that got exciting because now I was part of making that person successful. Yeah, their success rubbed off on me, but my job was to make them successful. Yeah. So, so okay. <laughs> I think we've laid out everything. Now, I always ask this question. But I have two questions this week, okay? Okay. Number one, from a PMBOK 7 standpoint, what would you tell an entry-level project manager? 
I would tell an entry level project manager to, first of all, for, <clears throat> this goes, I think we've had this discussion in the past, to first of all, please get grounded. Because, you know, it's, it's one thing to become the best buddy or the best um, humanistic project manager to your client and to your team. But if they see that you're not grounded in what it is that you're leading them into, you will lose respect from that perspective. So there the whole is, time, yeah, go ahead. The whole time we're talking about this humanistic approach or the human centered approach to managing projects, we are always saying that is based on standing on a foundation of strong, fundamental, and strong principles. Yeah, yeah. And I would call that before you invest too much in leadership, make sure your management skills are in place. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I grew up. I grew up, and let me let me just put this one because I want to hear your same thought process around this. But I grew up in an organization, as I mentioned when I started, that was very well known for its project management. But before you had to become a project manager, you had to serve almost an indentured servant servanthood <laughs> as a programmer, as a senior programmer, as a systems analyst, as a senior systems analyst, as a team lead, and you had to put two to three years in each of those before you were even considered for project management. Now you become a project manager, you've got all of that foundation laid out before you so that now you can start working on the, on the uh, leadership skills. So yes, I have long considered that project management may thrive and may be able to use wisely the concept of guilds. And what you're describing is basically a structure of a guild. Yeah. You get people committed to learning something very deeply, not just one aspect of the business, but all aspects of the business. And, and I agree with you totally on that. Well, and here's where it's helped me personally, is I, I broke into IT when it was the, the world, the dominance of big iron, right? I mean, huge mainframes filling entire floors of buildings. And so once I develop my, my prowess in those areas and then develop my leadership skills, when we went from big iron to microcomputers, from microcomputers to mini computers, from mini computers to now web-based processes, the technology didn't affect my ability to lead teams. Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, isn't that, isn't that something? It's, it's eloquent. <laughs> <laughs> so so there's another question but i think we're out of time and well, maybe next week we'll uh we'll uh, bring that question my question would be um and and let's add this to next week's conversation about the other domains my other question is how would you coach a seasoned project manager to approach the new edition of the PMBOK and this new mindset towards project management yeah that's good because if we get if we have a discussion like today we're not going to get through the other six less human centered <laughs> next week. yeah but. i i think i think we've done domains in general a great yeah. service and i think we've spent enough time with stakeholders and teams and looking at the others i think we can have a very oh. fascinating discussion as well i agree i agree because what does it do it takes us back to our more process oriented roots and so we can see how pinbox 7 now has shifted some of that into the domain thought process. Very good. I um, um, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Okay. So where so, are you going to be? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so I was going to ask the same question. I'll answer yours first. Um, right. I'll be over at LinkedIn. Um, I, I am going to be uh, answering some emails out there. If you uh, find me out there and want to connect, I'm always uh, I'm always uh, approachable and, and ask me questions. I generally um, check my uh, messages on Fridays right now. And as, as soon as things stabilize, I'll uh, probably check it more than like two or three times a week. But yeah, please, please connect with me and ask questions. I'm always up for questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm also over at LinkedIn, both for my, person, my personal name and my project, uh, my company name. But um, you know, there's times I'm also work actively working a project right now. And there's times that rather than be on LinkedIn, when the meetings get boring and they're not my meetings, when the meetings get boring, 
I'm also founding a domain called Wordle. Oh, cool. <laughs> so it's just a way of passing some time once in a while. But no, this has been a great discussion, Tim. Uh, domains, 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 they're going to be with us for a while. And I'm loving, I'm loving what's happening to our um, career, career process. I, I agree with you. This is, this is a great change and looking forward to more conversation on this next week. All right. Until next week, we'll see you. Thanks again.